Old School Lane Casual Chats is brought to you by OldSchoolLane.blogspot.com and is associated with Manic Expression, the Comic Book Cast, the Reopen Nickelodeon Studios and Orlando, Florida Facebook page, the PlayStation Let's Play channel, and for entertainment's sake. Welcome to a brand new episode of Casual Chats. I am Patricia, and I'm here with a few special guests. For our returning comers, we have Jim Bevan. Welcome back, Jim. Always good to be here. We have Ryan. Welcome back, Ryan. Yeah. And uh, we have a new guest with us. Uh, he is the um, main guy behind the Cartoon Corner Productions, as well as Chatterbox Unbound. We have uh, none other than Y Boy himself, Taylor. Welcome, Taylor. Yo, gl- glad to be on board. So today we're going to be discussing about something a little bit different around here. Uh, We're not going to be talking about a movie. We're not going to be talking about a TV show. We're actually going to be talking about a web series, something that you find only exclusively online. Today we're going to be talking about the terrain of magical expertise. So right before we get into uh, the topic, um, tell me how you guys uh, got introduced to it. Uh, I'm just trying to think because it was a long time ago. I probably probably just started from the very first episode I just was watching Kerber for his stuff, watching one of his music videos that he did on Super Mario RPG. Uh, now, so which one was it? Was it Waltz of the Forest or The Rawest Forest? Uh, I think it was Waltz of the Forest, because I was just really enjoying that, because his animation is, like, really top quality. He was, like, one of the, my most favorite, like, YouTube animators out there, right next to, like, Rob Benford of Knox Corner and Eagle Raptor, obviously. <laughs> yeah, when you think of Newgrounds, you immediately think of Eagle Raptor. Yeah, before, well, pre-Game Grumps Ego Raptor. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pre-Game Grumps Ego Raptor, we're talking about, like, the awesome series Ego Raptor. Yeah, yeah exactly. Not the, not, not the pissing everyone off by bashing Ocarina of Time. Oh, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> we will not be discussing it here. Trust me. I mean, the internet has already complained about it as it is. Uh, continue, Taylor. Uh, but yeah, I just watched, like, Waltz of the Fourth. I first saw Tome come up on my feed. And I just started watching, and I was just really intrigued by the whole na- narrative of it. Because I'm usually the sort of the guy that's like, I had the fan. It's like, what if I entered a video game and I could just fight and be all awesome and all that? And just seeing how he, like, constantly designed each and every single character model in it. Like, that was insane. Just, like, everybody out there. <laughs> like, that would take, like, days to do, like, each and every single character. And I was just really impressed by what Curriford did with his whole series. Overarching narrative and all that. Like, yeah. it's something that I really want to do someday. When it comes to online web series, you have all the famous ones. You have stuff such as Homestar Runner and Ed's World. A lot of these programs, they're very episodic, they're very short, and they're most of the times, like, gag-based, they're very humorous. But one of the good things about Tome Terrain and Magical Expertise is that the length is like a typical TV show episode, uh, running from, a, like, around... I would say like 15 to 25, even 30 minutes long, and also it has a flowing narrative. We'll be discussing more about that. So, um, Jim, how did you get introduced to Tome? I got introduced through um, another uh, another aspect of the internet that, shall we say, has seen better days. It was the That Guy with the Glasses forums. Well, now the channel also forums, but back when it was That Guy with the Glasses. And uh, someone posted it in the section on uh, online videos that weren't connected to the to the guys on the site, um, pointed out the new series that Kerberford made, and I bet at this point I wasn't that familiar with Chris's work, 
but they mentioned that a little Carrigo had a role in it, so I thought, ooh, I'd like to see what he's doing. Um, yeah, that's for the most part, that's how a lot of people were first introduced to it. Like, because, um, you know, either people like Little Karibo or Martin Bellamy, who is known for doing the Yu-Gi-Oh! Abridge series, or uh, Blake Swift, a.k.a. Shady Vox, known for Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, the Abridge series. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of other, you know, cameos and guests that we'll be discussing about later on. But for a lot of people, that's how they got introduced to it as well. Either that or they got introduced to it to, uh, on various ways. Uh, Ryan, how did you first get introduced to the show? Uh, I heard a lot of you guys talking about it. Oh, you, you got it from us? <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, no, well, no, I heard it before. I've been, like, meaning to, to watch it. I, like, for quite a while, I've been meaning to watch the show. And then I finally did last week. Oh, you just, yeah. wow, just recently. Wow, cool. Yeah, you're a new com- he's a newcomer. Yeah, he's a new guy. <laughs> Very nice. We'll take it easy on you. Yeah, we'll take it easy on you. All right. Um, anything else, Ryan? Uh, no, that's about it. Okay. Um, as for me, I had already been familiar with Chris's work, um, you know, ever since 2006. Uh, the first thing I saw from Chris's work was uh, the Parody Rangers, which was on the front page, and I had been following his work ever since. Then, when he made his announcement that he was going to be remaking his animated uh, Sprite series, TV Tome Adventures, I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to watch TV Tome Adventures before I get into Tome. And um, at first, I hated it. It was so slow. The characters were so either cliched or just (laughs) not very interesting. Uh, The show got really interesting until much later on throughout the series, but at that point, it was pretty much too late because around season four was canceled. Now, right before we talk about Tome, uh, have any of you guys ever seen TV Tome Adventures, which was the precursor to Tome? No. No, unfortunately. Okay. I well, tried to watch it, but since I saw Tome first, it was like, I was just, kind of, it's kind of hard to get into the group when you're seeing something that's, uh, when you're introduced to the better product, and then you see something that's a step back, and I don't wish to, I don't want to diss Chris, because I know he was still as he put, still put effort into TV Tom Adventures, but it just didn't show. It just didn't stand up to the quality of the reboot. Yeah, I, I, for all our listeners, if you're wondering, you do not have to watch TV Tom Adventures in order for you to get into Tom. It takes everything that was from the original and it makes it a whole lot better. Now, uh, for our listeners, I just want to tell you that we're, there are going to be spoilers in this podcast. We're going to be talking about extensively throughout the entire series of Tome. So if you have not seen it, I'm going to leave an annotation to the video or you can click on the description box for, below to, for you guys to catch up with it. And then as soon as you're done, you can come back here and we'll be discussing about it. Okay. So why don't we discuss about the first season? Now, there were 10 episodes in season one, and for those who want to know um, little bits about what the plot is, it focuses on an interactive virtual video game known as the Terrain of Magical Expertise. It takes place in the year 2020, and it mostly focuses on five main characters. You have Alpha, Flame Girl, Kerberfer, Game Craze, and Nylock. If you've ever read Ready Player One, it's kind of a similar basis to this in that everything is pretty much centered around this huge massive MMO that people can actually you know interact with through technological advances yes uh, according to many interviews from Chris including myself shameless plug um, he got his inspiration of doing Tome from two things uh, his love for Dot Hack and Mega Man Battle Network you have this gigantic uh, virtual world in which you can Uh either do combat or you can do socializing and uh, the main plot of the story is that there's this forbidden power that's hidden away in Tome. Alpha accidentally finds it, and it turns him into, like, this um, powerful player, and he's unable to control it at times. There's a group of hackers who are trying to find the forbidden power, and, you know, they try to see if maybe Alpha has the key to it, and then as time goes on, more and more hackers are introduced to the show, and there's a bigger plot that builds into it, but we'll be discussing about that later on. What would you say are your opinions on Season 1? Taylor? Uh, season one was a very strong season, care, like character design and animation wise. It like grew from each episode, like the very first season, like with all like stock stock pictures for like when everything was discussing because we had all like the subtitles at the bottom. And you know, above each side, we had each one of the characters. And it was just like blah 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 blah, just like a sock puppet sort of thing. As the, as the episodes went on, that animation got better and better. It was just kind of, like, distracting at first. It was like, oh, my God, you have such good animation, like, during the fight scenes and all that. And then when everyone's yeah. talking, it's sock puppets and sock puppets. Well, no, that's not, that's not just a system of that. They do that a lot in a lot of games, too. Quite a few JRPGs, um, if you play that, they just have the, you know, they have 
character profiles and, dot, and text boxes to cut down on animation. Yeah, tr yeah, true. I guess that's just sort of my thing. I even I don't even really like in sort of like JRPGs and all that. It just seems like I'd rather just have the text boxes there and just seeing like the little character models just walking on screen to places. Like I'd rather imagine it than just seeing the sock puppets <laughs> moving. Story wise, I just really I really liked it overall. Like Alpha's whole arc of being, wanting to become like a stronger player in the first episode, and then like he gaining like too much power. And by the end, end of the series, with the final, like, uh, I believe with the, what, what was it, the Yin Yang tournament or whatever? Yeah, the Gemini tournament. Gemini tournament, that's it. Like, as a crescendo of the whole arc for him, as he finally became okay with his power and all that, and was finally able to, like, get rid of it. Like, it became, like, a whole story about Alpha, which really, like, opened to me, because I felt like I wasn't. So, so like, understand what Alpha was going through. Just trying to, like, find a group of friends. Just trying to, like, become stronger for everyone. How about you, Jim? I like season one. It took me a while to get into it at first, though, because, again, going back to the JRPG thing, it does have a few uh, cliches you would expect in, like, uh, Japanese media or shonen anime. You have the forbidden power that bestows itself on someone. You have the fight. You have the tournament episode at the end. You have the reinforcement. You have discussions on the bonds of friendship and the importance of, you know, working together. And, you know, it's stuff you've seen before, but it's, it never comes off as cliche or trite. It's all handled very well. They do character building, they do world building, they give you a bit of mystery with the power that Alpha gets, and uh, you, know, you wonder what exactly caused this, what can it do. They give good focus to all the other characters, too, giving their own little arcs and help build up some mystery about them, especially with, uh, with Kurt preferring Game Crazed. Uh, how about you, Ryan? Uh, I thought the season one was pretty good. I, I thought there was some like neat like, character building stuff, and the uh, I really like the the, the way the mysteries were set up. Were pretty cool. I also like the little mini episodes they did that really helped. Oh yeah, yeah, that helped. Uh, yeah, they weren't a directly. Tr they didn't. You didn't have to watch them to get uh, crucial plot details, but um, they did help provide some further info, and a lot of them were really freaking hilarious, like uh, like the one with the, uh, I forget what it's called, but the one with the scammer who's trying to sell overpriced cake. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, 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 Ponyco, uh, who, the one, uh, from the, um, the short called, um, uh, Minigame Madness, uh, voiced by, uh, Chris Zito, a.k.a. Meat from Parody Rangers, uh, yeah, uh, it's very interesting. In that particular short, um, you have uh, the, f the, f the main female girl, Flame Girl, and uh, the, the two other female characters named Saturn Diva and Whitey, in which you have this guy named Ponico who comes along and tries to do all these, like, mini-games and tries to, you know, make them play it, and then all of a sudden he comes along and says, you know, hey, you can buy all these mini-games now! If you buy the 999 mini-game, you'll get one for free, and blah, 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 and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, I'm sure he's working for EA or Activision now <laughs> handling microtransactions. <laughs> yes, exactly. Anyway, um, as for me, uh, yeah, I, I, similar to Jim, uh, I did enjoy Tome when it came out on Newgrounds, but it was a bit of a slow burn for me. Uh, I was enjoying them just fine. It's just that I felt that it was getting a little bit repetitive with every single hacker coming in, like a new hacker coming by every episode and trying to get the Forbidden Power. And, uh, you know, it, it kind of felt like a little bit uh, at first formulaic. But then, you know, things started getting a little bit more interesting along the lines of um, episodes four and five. Episode four in which you have the side quest in which they're gathering up pieces of the Shadow Guard Beast. And uh, then episode five, in which the forbidden power becomes completely out of control, and uh, Alpha, you know, overcomes with the forbidden power, and he turns into Demon Alpha. And then we have our introduction to uh, the main hacker, who's known as Zeto. Um, and then you have that amazing fight scene with the buildings and the music playing in the background. And yeah, it's a really, really awesome episode. That was the episode that immediately got me hooked into Tome, even though that while I was enjoying it. Uh, you know, it was the episode that wanted me to get hooked into more. And uh, it's funny, Jim, because when I was posting my top ten favorite Tome episodes all the way back in July, you were talking about how, um, you know, how much you enjoyed episode four because of the friendship building it was doing, like the scene with the campfire. And I, w I didn't really fully appreciate that until I started watching, like, the Fact Bubble specials and also... Um, 
when I was doing my video series on what Wolvolution meant to me. For those who don't know, Wolvolution was the video game tournament group that I was a part of from 2006 to 2009. I already did an entire video on that, and I also interviewed the founder himself, so you can go check that out. But, yeah, I mean... The whole fact about Alpha talking about wanting to meet his friends in real life, the friends that meant a lot to him in a time in which he felt awkward and shy towards everybody around him, and that, you know, being in this game, all the hours that they were able to put in, it wasn't just a waste of, it wasn't a waste of time, and it wasn't, um, it wasn't for naught. It was something that was character building. It was something that people can be able to see and showcase about, hey, you know, doing stuff online, whether it be playing an MMORPG or talking to friends on a website or doing collaborations with people or meeting them in a convention or whatever. It's like, it's not a waste of time. It's actually, it's actually a good way in order for you to yeah. build in long lasting friendships. Well said. It shows how, you know, it shows how, despite what some people may say, you actually can build, you know, strong bonds even without directly seeing people. You get another, tip, you get another bit of that in uh, episode six, Dragon Drama, where with Nylock, and for those who aren't familiar, uh, Nylock, that's the character Martin Villainy voices. He's always, he's almost always role playing, you know, like a chivalrous knight from the medieval times. But this is an episode where he drops the act, and you know, he's he opens himself up, reveals the problems he was having in his life and how being on Tome and associating with so many new people kind of helped him get out of his funk. But it also shows that he isn't quite prepared to let people really see the real him, which is why he does the role-playing. He's putting on a mat, just putting up a shield. But yeah. he's slowly, yeah. he's slowly I... working towards bringing it down. Yeah, it's sort of kind of like how I felt when I first started old school lane, in which at the time I was unemployed, I was no longer going to school, and I needed an escape from my life. And starting that and, you know, posting things of the topics that I loved and doing eventually the podcast a few years later, it felt wonderful to me because it was therapeutic and I was able to meet a lot of great friends, especially for, you know, you guys and everybody from Manic Expression. Uh, let's continue on with the topic. Um, one of the great things about uh, Tom, when seeing the show, especially, you know, all over again throughout season one, one of the good things about the show was the soundtrack. Um, how were you guys? What is your opinion on the soundtrack? The soundtrack is amazing. I, I really do like it. If I actually had like the disposable income to do it, I would buy a soundtrack of it because like Blake Swift's work is like amazing. Like I, I subscribed to, Bla uh, to Blake's cha channel like a while ago as soon as I found out that he was playing Alpha, and I've been following him ever since. Like he's sung a bunch of songs. Like, even past Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, he has his own album and all of that, own music videos, videos, and the stuff he's done for the actual tone, like that opening, in no, it's not an opening, closing <laughs> theme. <laughs> the dog agrees with me. Yes, exactly, a, the dog, a, the, the dog, do yes, the dog loves the soundtrack. <laughs> the closing theme is something that I listen to quite often, like, I have it on, like, my U a YouTube playlist that I, like, listen to while I work. This is such a, like, a bombastic sort of song that it basically makes you pumped up. But it, it's, it's a, as a closing credit theme, it just makes you pumped up. It's like, ah, oh, damn it, I gotta wait a few months until I see the next episode. Yeah. Yeah. It does get, that, that, that theme does really get you pumped up. I like, I like the music in general. It has, it definitely has, like, a feeling of being in a, you know, in a, I guess you could say a virtual environment, but it doesn't go, like, overboard. It has, it has just the right amount of an electronic subtext to it. If that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's a really good soundtrack. I own this. I own the soundtrack myself. I own the soundtrack for season one and two. I don't own the orchestral soundtrack, which I'll get to at some point. But yeah, the soundtrack, which is done by Weston Durant, aka Cage Master Cadget. Uh, he's known for doing a lot of um, you know personal projects, but not much of a musician at the time. The music was originally going to go to this um, video game that never, see, you know, that eventually just became canceled, and it was just sitting in his, into his like website collecting, um, you know, not being used at all. And then Chris listened to it, and he's like, you know, I want to use your soundtrack, and he's like, yeah, that'd be awesome. And then as time went on, um, you know, one of the songs which you were mentioning before the closing theme, which is called "Battle On," and it has you know uh, Chris and uh, Blake swing uh, singing the uh, the lyrics. 
Um, and yeah, that is a really awesome song. Uh, if you haven't listened to it, you should definitely check it out. There's also Nylock's theme song featured in episode six, which is also a really good one. You know, and Martin's an amazing singer. If you ha- if you guys haven't listened to that, oh, and yeah, I've listened to it a bunch of times as well. Yeah, it's a great song. Martin is a great singer. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, now let's continue on. You know, finishing up with season one. Um, another thing that I really liked, uh, just like you were mentioning before, uh, Taylor, was the Gemini tournament. Uh, the, Gen- the Gemini tournament, uh, you have um, you know all the characters joining this massive tournament to see who is the best team player. And it's kind of funny because in the original TV Tome Adventures, it was Zeto who threw the tournament. It was called the Z Tournament. And the reason why he threw it was because so he can prove to himself as being the best gamer in the world. It's kind of self-indulgent, but whatever. But yeah... Um, and this, uh, the, it, yeah, the Gemini tournament, it's really hilarious. A uh, lot of, some of the best fighting in the entire series, and some of my favorite lines. Like, I remember the one line in which you have um, Forever, the Gemini tournament announcer, who's doing all this commentating, and then uh, Saturn Diva's like, oh my god, will she just shut up? And then she goes into this tangent. It's like, uh, you know, that guy's doing a thing, that guy's doing a thing. I play video games, so many video games. Then she goes up to him and says, hey, are we downright fierce enough for you? And then eventually she just pile drives forever out of the turn, uh, out of the stage. And then she's like, it was so worth it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I forgot about that. Yeah. There were, there were some hilarious moments in there. I think probably my best with my favorite moment had to be the pairing between, um, sniper wheel and Aster Rob. Oh yes. Uh, performed oh, by yeah. John Tron and Masako X from team four star. Yes, who are really exaggerating their roles because, I mean, they're, it's very funny seeing a very abrasive Brooklyn guy teamed up with a rather neat, nebbish British Brit. And my, one of my favorite lines from uh, Sniper Wheel was in episode two in which Kerberfer and Sniper Wheel are fighting against one another and he pulls out the giant cannon from his chest and Kerberfer is like, what is that? And he's like, it's my head cannon and in my head cannon, you die. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, there was a lot of great moments. Uh, again, going back to the Gemini tournament, one of my favorites is um, when Zeto and Kizuna, uh, Kizuna, who happens to be Zeto's partner and another fellow hacker, uh, also known as Tiger Lily, there's this one scene in which uh, you have these two pairings of these two over exaggerative Japanese guys named Shogun and Suzuku. And, you know, they're talking, they're doing this huge monologue saying about how they're going to defeat them. And then you have Zeto with his arm cannon and Kizuna with her sharpshooting gun just shooting away their swords until it chips off. And then Zeto comes along and he just says, dead. And then they're all just <laughs> crying and just sniveling with one another while Zeto charges up his uh, arm cannon. And then Suzuku does this confession. He's like, I have something to tell you, dude. I'm not really Japanese. I'm Chinese. <laughs> And then Shogun is like, you son of a bitch. And then he blasts him away. And <laughs> But yeah, uh, you know, not only were there a lot of funny moments, but there were a lot of um, dramatic moments as well, which I'm sure we'll get to. But l- let me hear some of your favorite comedic moments in season one. The only thing, the thing with John Tron showing up, that was like some of the tough quality comedy right there. John Tron is just such a great personality. Just yeah. bring, brings this like Brooklyn, <laughs> Brooklyn accent, a Brooklyn attitude <laughs> to any any performance as Sniper Wheel, oh. and again pairing him off with Moscow X as the timid, weak, weak little Brit- British guy. I'm it sorry. Just hilarious. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just makes you think. Why would he want to team up with that? <laughs> Until Moscow takes off his tie and makes his hair all cool. How about you, Jim? Like, uh, Aside from uh, John Tron's very moments, pretty much any time Raccoon shows up, was always you were always in the mood for something good. Oh yes, I, I love the character of Raccoon. He was he's kind of like um, uh, sort of like an exaggerative Looney Tunes character. I think he you know one of his proud uh, one of his fine moments where he shined was he became one of the villains in Episode Four, in which he turns into Monster Raccoon, fusing with the um, uh, the Shadow Guard Beast. Yeah, and then he just, and then he's always, he's trying to be over-exaggerated, mocking the guys, and then he just gets his ass handed to him, and he's just so timid and neat. Yes, yes, and of course we cannot forget the infamous line about that he is not a rodent. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I also, I also love this one from the short where, uh, he runs into some players he pissed off earlier, and they're looking to get revenge, and when he encounters, and when one of them threatens them, uh, one of the players, who's an Australian guy, asks if he has any last words. Raccoon just says, 
Oh, Quark, you may cross another shrimp, toss another shrimp on the lobby. I think there's a thing that we can maybe not go play this week, too. <laughs> just got to rub, just you got to rub the balls on the guy. Yes, yeah. I agree. How about you, Ryan? Uh, the headcanon mind is funny. Mm-hmm. I think I like the parts, I think, I think it was episode four where, uh, Joe Baku, like, just runs off the cliff. I think I laughed at that. Yes, yes, that's uh, the yeah. one. Yes, he yeah. does. And then he just, and then he says in the end, I did not expect things to end this way. Uh, that's about it. Oh, okay, that's fine. Of course, there's a lot of other moments, uh, like when Kerberfer confronts uh, Sniperware for the first time, and then, uh, you know, Sniperware tells him about, oh, um, are you engaging me? And then uh, Kerberfer's like saying, oh, um, engaging? I'm not going to marry you. I'm going to kick your ass. What about the Stegosaurus girl? Who oh, Granda, yes. <laughs> <laughs> she, looks, she, looks so, she looks so mild, but when she gets pissed off, she, get, she, ends, up, uh, <laughs> she ends up kicking people's asses. Especially Nylock. Oh, yeah, Nylock gets whooped by her off screen, and when King Kree asks what happened, she says, I was violated by a dinosaur in the form of a scruffy little Vietnamese girl. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, uh, you know, in episode four, in which um, when Flame Girl's trying to solve the puzzle involving with the elements, and then uh, Nylock is distracting. Uh, Grand with Granda, you know, attacking him voliciously, and then Flame Girl's just like, no, 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 not now, Nyla. Like, I'm trying to solve this puzzle, and then he's just being beaten and bombarded. It's kind of funny because you know, with Nyla being a really skilled player, you would think that he would be able to defeat her. I mean, he had d- he had done so in episode two, but yeah. man, she was just like Granda was like very, very wild, and she was ballistic. <laughs> She always seemed pissed off. Yes, she did. And, uh, you know, her uh, her partner and sidekick was this calm Scottish guy named T-Bones. It's like with Sniper Wheel and Astarob. It's like, how can you see these two together? It's like, why? It's also bad for him. It's like, how do you deal with her? I have no idea. Anyway, so um, now that we talked about our some of our funniest moments, let's talk about some of the dramatic moments, because there were a lot of them in season one. Um, you know, one of my favorites, like you were saying before, Jim, about how Nylog, he just let down his guard and confessed to game craze about that, you know, his life was hard and mundane, and then he plays Tome as an escape. There's also another person who plays Tome as an escape, and it becomes a quite a huge conflict, especially when season two comes about. And I'm sure for a lot of people who've already seen the show, I, I mean, I didn't see it coming. I don't know if you guys saw it coming, but the huge reveal, the huge reveal that Kerberfer and Zeto are the same person. I did not That's see this coming. Yes, I did not yeah. see this coming, especially because since in TV Tome Adventures, Kerberfer and Zeto were two different people. But yeah, yeah. I, I did not, I did not see this coming. It was a shock to me, and it took me until like Plan Z, the last short of season one, that I was able to fully understand what was going on. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know why. I, I didn't actually feel shocked about that. Oh, really? Usually, it was, yeah, but usually it was played by... They were both played by Chris. I was just supposed to be thinking, like, yeah, he's obviously going to be the same person. I don't My brain was just thinking it the whole time. Well, remember that in the... If you'd looked at the credits, uh, Zeto was voiced by Tony A. Campbell. So he put in right. a pseudonym. Oh, yeah, I remember, remember the pseudonym. I just mostly just realized, like, those voices sound awfully too similar <laughs> to two different people. Yes, and uh, this wouldn't be the first time in which we have another character portrayed as another character, but we'll get into that. But yeah, um, you know, episode 10, which was building up into uh, a huge battle with Alpha and Zeto, with, uh, you know, Alpha being too overtaken by the Forbidden Power, becoming a huge threat to everybody around him. And then Zeto finally reveals more information about what the Forbidden Power is, and then tries to remove it due to Astarob's um, uh, beta-tested item that was released yeah, early. A shield. Yeah, a shield that can yeah, be able yeah. to absorb energy. It was a yeah, it was a shield that was able to absorb energy, and Zeto was able to take the code and he was able to put it into his own cannon so he can absorb the forbidden power. And then eventually it didn't work out, and he becomes overtaken with the forbidden power, becoming Demon Zeto. And that fight, which was. It was the it was probably the highlight of season one for me. I don't know about you guys. Yeah, it's oh, yeah. a great thing. Yeah, 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 it was. It, it really and, and it had to be. So you gotta save the best for last, and uh, they did. Yes, they did. Yeah. All right. Um, right before we uh, go on to season two, um, 
I just want to know uh, from your perspectives, what is your favorite episode of season one? That's a very hard question for me. I really like, just like a tome, like more like all together as a whole package sort of thing. Like it is an episodic sort of series, but I just more see like when I see it, I see it all like all clumped together. Like there's not really a sort of like a bad or worse episode to me. So I can't really pick a favorite moment. Oh. I would just say that Gemini Terminus is my most favorite like arc of the whole first season. Oh, fair enough. I just like Terminus, Terminus Sagas. Sure. How about you, Jim? Uh, probably I'd have to say either episode four or episode six, if only because of the great character moments in them. All right. How about you, Ryan? No, I don't know. It's a lot easier for me to pick the best and worst episode when, like, when it's not like a continuous narrative. Like, when it's a, it's a continuous narrative, I have a hard time picking the best episode. Okay, so you're leaning towards what Taylor said. That's understandable. Yeah. Um, as for me, my favorite episodes of season one would have to be either episode five or episode ten. Mostly because episode five was what really got me interested more into Tome, and episode ten was definitely um, the finest moments of the entire series culminated together into one. So now we can reach over to season two, and season two was done thanks to a huge crowdfunding campaign over at GoFundMe. Uh, where he was able to, um, you know, do the, f the the six episodes that season two would become. And I remember when episode 11 first came out, there was a huge rebuttal over the designs. The designs that were so incredibly different, being um, monochromatic colors, and everybody was just complaining and wondering why did he decide to choose this design. What are you guys' opinions on the design? Did you hate it, or did you find it okay? I didn't have much... I didn't have too many problems with it. I just figured, you know, he want, I just figured Chris wanted to try a new art style. It just isn't that uncommon. I mean, you know, animated series have switched designs before. I was I was kind of thrown off more by like the excessive amount. I don't forget me. I don't want to sound like I'm a prude. I was a little thrown off by more the excessive amount of like uncensored swearing because in season one they had they tended like to censor, you know, put in bleeps for heavy swears, but now they were letting it go pretty much uncensored, and at first I didn't realize why, but as you get further in the season, you kind of understand why it's because things have gotten a lot uh, a lot more dire than, you know, shit got real. Right. <laughs> How about you, Taylor? Uh, for me, it was just a little bit hard to, like, get, get used to the coloring, because I didn't think there were bad designs. I just thought maybe the coloring was a little bit weird. Because, like you said, it's monochromatic with, like, yeah. like alpha, well, being re alpha being red, curve for being blue, flame girl being kind of orange. This seems, like, too powerful of a single color in each one of the characters. Like, what I like about the first one is, like, you've got, like, the one thing that signifies each character. Like, alpha with its red hair. Uh, Nylock with his green armor. <laughs> then I've noticed thing that, yeah, you can instantly, like, as a viewer, just, like, oh, that's their thing. That's what, like, makes you remember them. Like, that's what makes, like, some of the baddest characters. Like, if you take The Simpsons, for example, like, you can see, like, his Homer's, like, three, like, three-haired comb-over. Marge's big blue hair. There's usually something about a character, like, that one thing that makes, like, makes you, like, instantly remember them. Even if you, like, haven't watched it, like, months and months, that's the one thing that you remember. With these characters, it sort of just all blends together sort of thing. Like, you still have the resemblance to the first season's models, but with the everything being, like, the same color, it just sort of all blurs together for me. Like, I didn't really care about the comments at all. Like, they were, they were all completely, like, different is bad, different is bad. Isn't that with everything on the internet ever? Well, well, well anything that's different is automatically bad. Did you know that? But no, I'm not saying, like, different is bad. I'm just more saying no. from an artistic standpoint, I felt like the whole, like, one color thing was making the whole character model kind of muddled together. Even though the character models were... <laughs> Like, all still top quality to me. Like, everyone else had that sort of, like, distinct model to them because they had, like, various colors on them. Like, the Game Masters and all that. Like, they had great designs to them. Oh, the Net like, Kings, yes. Net, Net Kings, that's what I meant. Yeah, well, we'll be talking about them in a little bit because they were, like, um, some of the highlights for me in Season 2. Uh, anyway, uh, continuing on with um, the color topic, uh, what do you have to say about it, Ryan? Uh, I was fine with it because I, I, I already kind of knew about it coming into the show, so... It didn't bother, it didn't charge him, charm him too much. Okay, that's understandable. It was very different, that's for sure, that these characters were protruded into these different colors. And then as time went on, for me, i kind of gotten used to it. I could understand why people complained about it, because it was focusing on just this one major color. And 
you know, maybe from a design perspective, you know, just like you were saying before, Taylor, that there was a lot of, like, small little details in a lot of the characters in Season 1 that made them stand out and memorable. And, it, and you know, it kind of lost that in Season 2. But, you know, as time went on, I kind of gotten used to it. Now, oh, yeah, I believe everyone would have gotten used to it. Because their characters were still all good, like, personality-wise, they all stayed the same, and that's what gravitated us towards them. Like, we may have lost, like, the design aspect that made us, like, signify in our brains, like, oh, that's Alpha, oh, that's Flame Girl. But right. But we got still personality-wise, oh, yeah, that is Alpha and Flame Girl, and that's why I love them. Right, 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 of course. All right, um, now that we got um, that uh, elephant in the room out of the way, let's talk about some of our favorite moments of Season 2. So, uh, go ahead, Taylor. Uh, some of my favorite moments in season two, it was the Net King fights were my most favorite moments. Like, those fights were, like, some of the most spectacular fight scenes ever. And I liked how each and every single main character got their own sort of fight scene, and they all did it, like, in a different way. Like, when Cumberford faced uh, the mu- mushroom guy, like, I keep, keep forgetting the Net King's name. Bitch, bitch, B- oh, Bitchroom, yeah. Bitchroom, yeah, Bitchroom. Like, a whole Super Mario sort of level, and how he was just, like, firing the levels back and... Back at him, like that was amazing. Like, you know, cover for the end. like, I beat everyone. I am the king. <laughs> I am the greatest character in this game. I am better than the. Um, let's see. I am better than the mushroom and the angel and the crystally douchebag and the old grandpa combined. So shut up and suck it. <laughs> yeah, even the dog agrees with it. <laughs> That's all right, Ryan. Anyway, so uh, continue, Taylor. I'm sorry. That was the actual moment where, where everything changed, for even the characters. Like, we finally got, like, what was actually going on, like, how the Net Kings were involved in all that. Because in the first season, we saw a little bit of the Net Kings and all that. Just like, oh, we can finally learn something about them. We can finally learn something about the whole development of the game. Yeah. And, and, and I think what really also helped the Net Kings stand out was, like, how, how Chris managed to get some pretty prominent voice actors for them. John St. John, Kyle Hebert... Lowenthal. Michelle Knotts and uh, Todd Abercorn. Yes, and then and it's funny because Ryan, I remember you posting the other day about how why does Bang Zoom constantly have Bryce Pappenbrook as the main protagonist? And funny, funny thing enough, Bryce Pappenbrook does make an appearance on Tone, but he's one of the admins and he doesn't even have a lot of lines. I bet that was like I bet that was kind of like serendipitous for you. No, I was not thinking. I was mostly just like, throwing that as a joke because some people were, just, some, some people were, you know, I was, I was mostly, I wasn't being that serious. I know, I know, I was just joking as well. Anyway, um, so yeah, the Net King battles were definitely a huge highlight for me. I mean, there were so many to, you know, discuss about with every single one of them. You know, uh, you know we have an exec who's the oldest amongst everybody, and he's very confident in his skills. Uh, we have, um... Kinder Spirit, who's like the sweet, kind um, admin, and then she goes head over heels with Kerber for a saying of how cute he was, and Ruby Rules, who d- dons the uh, Zeto disguise, fooling everybody, and then he, he goes on this long tangent when he disguises himself as Zeto, it's like, you know, it's me, you know, I am the, I am the winner of the Gemini tournament, and blah, 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 and stuff like that, and then uh, every time that he disguises himself as like all the other characters, and... And then he goes, uh, you know, then yeah, he turns into Nylog when he was fighting him. And he's like, you know, I created your design. It's more, more like, I am your father. And, you know, then, of course, we have, like, um, you know, Bitchroom, of course, who uh, has the Super Mario level. And, you know, definitely one of the funniest moments throughout the entire series you know, with him taunting Kerberfer. Uh, until he snaps. Yeah, until he snaps. And, you know, then, of course, we have that huge battle with uh, Webmaster and Game Craze fighting together. And it was, um, you know, with the huge supernovas and stuff like that, which was pretty cool. Yeah. I really gotta, I gotta say, it, is, it was kind of a risk because I didn't think it would work at first going from one season that ended it with a battle turn with a tournament arc to going into another straight fighting arc. But it worked well because they gave they made all the fights memorable and they, all the characters stuck out. Yeah, I mean, if it was just constant fighting after constant fighting, it'll get boring after a while. <coughs> Dragon Ball Z. <coughs> Sorry. Bleach. Yes, Bleach. <laughs> no, dis- no disrespect, but trust me. If you're going to substitute fighting over good characters and story, then why even bother? You might as well watch wrestling at this point. 
<laughs> yeah. Exactly. exactly. Take notes. Take notes of aspiring writers. Yes. <laughs> and, and then, of course, you know, everything that ju- doesn't end like all sunshine and rainbows, we also get like the information about how the Ned Kings may possibly know about the forbidden power. And, you know, then it would lead up into um, the quote unquote origin tragic episode known as Episode Zero. At episode Zero, we also get our first introduction to. Um, to Softy, who is this uh, computer program who kind of helped build up Tome. And, um, you know, we get origins of the, the Neck Kings and all that stuff, and, and, you know, just, you know, how kind of the power of greed and selfishness was able to get the forbidden power created in the first place. Yeah, it deals with, the, yeah, it deals with corruption and also the kind of like the, the moral, uh, ethical problems that come with... Uh, the idea, they come with this idea that's not original, but the idea of what happens when soft when a program becomes sapient, self-aware. Mm-hmm. You know what exact, what exact, how exactly do you treat it like? A, you know, does it have the same capacity as a human? Does it have the same rights as a human? What should be done with this artificial creation that is aware of itself and its surroundings and can think and grow? Right. Exactly. And it's and I really like how it shows. You know, it's not brushed up. It's not brushed aside because all of season two is showing how the net king, how the net kings came up with, how the net kings dealt with it, and basically the consequences that they had to live with. Yeah, the consequences they had to live with with getting um, Alpha Flame Girl Kerberfer, Nylock, and Game Craze into this when they shouldn't have in the first place. They were there just to play the game for fun. And then all of a sudden they get themselves into like this huge predicament that involved with the. Um, you know, the lives of a lot of people. Because unlike a lot of um, things where if you're playing a video game and you get yourself hurt, you know, you, if you get stabbed or if you get shot or something, it doesn't hurt you. But in the, the case of the Forbidden Power, no. If you do get hurt in the game, you actually get hurt physically in real life. But, well, not real life. It's more like it's it's in your mind. It's, it, it's You like, feel the pain. It's like bio... But like biofeedback, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I was always wondering about that. Like, how is the game to the play where you can actually physically physically get hurt by it? Like, we're in like 2020 in this series, right? Do we have like in sort of online where everyone's wearing a helmet to play the game, or what's going on with that? How is the forbidden power actually hurting somebody in the real world? Well, uh, it was explained in the fact bubbles in episode zero that you see, um, because the forbidden power was built in. Uh, you know, through this advanced technology. And then, you know, when it was fed the emotions from Softy after she excreted it out, do, deal with, dealing with all the, the, the stigma of, uh, of selfishness and corruption and greed that the Net Kings were being portrayed in creating this huge world. When it hit over to the Shadow Guard Beast that they were programming to be the first boss... Uh, you know, as time went on, it you know because of it getting you know the emotions and being an amalgamation of all the things filled with greed and corruption and anger. When you know p- people get hurt with it in real life, you can be able to feel it from your mind, and it can you know corrupt you in some way. Like it was explaining about like when, um, like when Alpha is being corrupted by the forbidden power in his mind. It's like, um, you know, his mind is completely overtaken and. Um, you know, when, uh, and also in the scene in episode zero in which Zeto's arm gets cut off, he actually feels the pain in his mind that, you know, it felt like an axe, uh, it felt like an axe just chopped through his arm. So, yeah, it is explained in the fact bubbles if you do see them. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, I just still, still find it sort of odd in a way, even though we can just all say it's like future technology and all of that. Yeah, we can, we can, we can blame the future for that, exactly. It's future technology. <laughs> Future technology. Future technology, where cars fly and we have perfect Pepsi and flying hoverboards. Now, continuing on with our discussion, uh, what were your favorite episodes on season two? Uh, Taylor, is it the same thing with you in which you just saw the whole thing as together in one? I don't, I don't, I don't know about that, because season two for me felt a little bit, a little bit uneven in a way as it reached the final finale. I thought it was all, all good as well. But there's just something off about it to me. Like, a little bit of it was rushed in a way. Hmm. <laughs> like, well, we can discuss that when we get to, like, the specific episodes. What? Like, my what? F- favorite episode, would, would it be uh, episode two when we finally have that, 
discussion of what, like, what Alpha and the game have been doing with, in correspondence with the Net Kings as well, which we finally see those two forces really clash together in a more discussion base rather than just fighting each other. Right, right, okay. Um, how about you, Jim? Um, I actually try to take Taylor's perspective with this season more because it was basically one huge arc, no, like, with the with nothing really, no, nothing really separating the episodes. But if I had to say which was the best, um, forgive me for being predictable, it would have to be the final one when everything culminates. Okay, uh, Ryan, uh, do you have what are your favorite episodes in season two? Uh, episode twelve, probably. Okay, episode twelve. Uh, why is that? Yeah, I just, like, I just really like the fights in it, and I, and I like that that moment at the end, and Alpha just loses it. Um, as for me, yeah, I'm going to have to go with Jim. My favorite episode was 15, in which everything was able to build up together into one package. And um, if, if I had to choose another, it would be episode 12. Because similar to, like, episode 5, uh, you have the, the great fights, you have all the great quotes and all the great moments that was able to showcase about the true, um, the true drama that was going on in Tome, as well as showcasing about, once again, similar to episode 4, about the gang wanting to meet each other again in real life because the prize uh, was is that if they were able to beat the Night Kings, they were able to have any wish that they wanted. And they were talking about they wanted to meet each other in real life. And then in the final scene in episode 15, we were able to see that. But unlike... Uh, now, I didn't expect this, but it wasn't animated. It was actually showcased in live... It was actually showcased live, like actual people portraying as the characters. Yeah, I think it actually was the the voice the voice actors themselves at a convention. Yeah, uh, well, not necessarily so because it was actually two of the voice actors from the show and two other people. Um, in the in the live action version, um, Alpha was being portrayed by Mike Lucas, who, which was who was Chris's best friend, and that's who Alpha was based off of. And you know, uh, Nylock and Kerberfer slash Zedo, they were by you know my, by Martin and Chris respectively. And then the fourth one, who was Flame Girl, that was performed by um, Martin's friend Emily Nicholas. And the reason why she was cast it was because Chris wanted a little bit more diversity because in in his head canon, Flame Girl is Filipino, so that's why he casted her as opposed to Anna Kingsley, who was the actual voice of Flame Girl, and Blake Swift, who's the voice of Alpha. Ah, uh, my, my mistake. No, no, you're fine. You're fine. But yeah, um, I, I don't know about you guys, and this is probably going to sound a little bit schmaltzy and maybe a little bit dumb, but when I saw that final moment, I cried. I, I cried, but it, it, it was a pretty good scene. Yeah. Well, you have to understand, because I've been following it for so long at that point, and knowing Chris's work for almost a decade at that point, seeing all of the stuff that he did previously... Uh, you know, all the stuff with the Parody Rangers, the Nintendo collabs, and all these parody things that he was known for for a very long time. And then him pulling off something like that. I mean, I was not only proud of the characters and stuff like that, but I was also proud of Chris himself because I knew of his work from back then. And I just, you know, I, I felt, you know, in my opinion, that was like his finest hour. He was able to pull in all the skills that he had learned at that point and able to showcase it wonderfully. Maybe, Agreed. maybe that's maybe that's why I I cried. You know, uh, of course with the yeah. characters as well, yeah. but that was partly yeah. why. Well, it is it is kind of a sad ending because it's so its ending is because it's so I guess it's ambiguous. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if you don't know what's going to happen. What becomes of Softy? You don't know whether the game is going to get shut down or not, and whether all these people who have you know forged bonds are going to be separated again. It is quite sad. Yeah. Well, I guess not sad, but yeah. It's a bit bittersweet, I understand. Another bittersweet moment for me was what happened to Kizuna at the end. When, you know, Kizuna was approaching Softy, and she was really upset about that. She thinks that Softy was the one who caused the forbidden power and everything, like all the tragic events that was occurring, and then at the end, Zeto shot behind her back. And it's kind of a sad thing, because if you saw episode zero, Kizuna was a very confident and very enthusiastic person who always joked around with Zeto. But then she transformed herself into like this overworking, stressed out person who's willing to do everything just so that Zeto can be able to be rectified after getting his arm cut off. And then after what happened with, um, you know, her being shot in the back, that was kind of shocking to me. Yeah, it, that's kind of, it kind of carries in more of that theme of the episode uh, that was present, featured in that episode about when you have to do something, is it, you know, is it morally right or is it just right for the moment, for the one person? 
Yeah, and and also speaking of that, um, the 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 main villain who was eventually revealed was Ruby Rules, and in the original TV Tome Adventures, it was Exec, and his discussion about how you know because Softy was um, you know a computer, a computer program that can be able to have you know, technology that was higher than anything, artificial intelligence. They should be able to share it with the world. They should be able to make the world a better place. And, you know, he was willing to do everything in order for that to be fulfilled. Even so much as, like, when he got both the forbidden power and the virus, uh, and not the virus, the antivirus, that was part of the dragon bug, um, you know, Flame Girl was trapped inside of it, and he was willing to sacrifice Flame Girl just so, you know, he can be able to become well-known in his discovery. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, because at first, it, you, have, you really have to look back to understand why Ruby Rules would, you know, basically turn on everyone like that. But you do see the hints there, and I have to say, he's, an interest, he's somewhat interesting as, a, as the main villain, because you can understand his ultimate agenda. He's not being, you know, evil just to, just for evil's sake. He really does think that this technology can help humanity, but he's willing to make, he's willing to sacrifice the happiness and well-being of others to do it. And he even admits that he's looking forward to making a profit from it and becoming, you know, and going down in history as one of the revolutionaries of mankind. Right. Uh, how about you, uh, Taylor? Before, like, the guy might have revealed himself, I felt like it was very fitting of him. Like it was all mostly synonymous for the big, like the main villains was going to be like the old exec guy. And it was just, oh, oh so obviously he's old, he just cared about the money and all that. Oh, of course, it's good because he just looks evil that sort of way. So like, no, no, Chris is smarter than that. Like we have, we have the hope, hopeful youth who just wants to change the world for the better. That felt like thematically that's what where Chris was going. And from a burning perspective and as a writer myself, I applauded Chris for that. Because it actually, like, speaks with the theme and all that. Like, the youth, like, bringing forth the new changes in the world and all that. Yeah. Whether it be in Tome or the real yeah. world. Yeah, and again, it ties into the issue of, you know, if Softy is sapient, you know, can you just treat her like a simple program or do you treat her like an individual? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It has, uh, well, it hasn't been 100% confirmed if Chris is going to continue on with, you know, either season three or with a game. But from what we understand for the most part, he is pretty much finished with the story. And he's kind of at a turning point in which he doesn't... Now, uh, I can't take this for credit, but, uh, you know, shout-outs to a Kirby Kerberfer for coming up with this idea. But there are seven questions. Uh, let's start off with the first question. And uh, the first question is... Um, let me just pull out the questions really quick. Okay. Ah, here it is. Okay, right, so... Ben Carson, the first question is for you. <laughs> Really? Oh, sorry. Really? Ah, ha, ha. Oh, oh, sorry. I'm oh, sorry. I got, I got the format confused. You're fine. You're fine. <laughs> okay, so the questions were... Um, okay, so every single day there was a question that was asked, and you know each person would answer it in some way. So, okay, day one. The question was, who is your favorite character? So, um, you, guys, uh, you, uh, you guys can answer. So, Taylor, who is your favorite character? Or characters? I would say my favorite character is Alpha. He's just sort of like nice, timid, everyman sort of thing. That that became a much more stronger person as he experienced the the power of the forbidden power. And like the original like intention was just to protect his friends and help with the hackers and all that. But he re- but he realized soon after that that's not really what the power had he wanted. <laughs> he, he wanted the power to protect, but he wanted that to be with from with himself. And that, that's the, after he lost the power, he began to find that again, was collabing with everybody in Tome. And that's at the end, he was finally able to, like, show its true power, be able to beat the Forbidden Power, and basically take control of it, and have a new, badass, like, half Forbidden Power form. All right, uh, Jim. My favorite character? Yeah. Um, forgive me for being predictable. Nylock! <laughs> <laughs> Nylock, okay. master of being predictable. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I, like, huh? I, I couldn't resist. There's just so much I like about him. There's his design, um, his voice. Again, Martin does a stellar job. His hidden depths and just how <laughs> he steals every scene he's in. What can I say? All right. Um, how about you, Ryan? Uh, I'd say Kerber for my favorite. I thought all art was brilliant. It was really neat. And like, he, like, he's trying to, like, you have to balance the fact that 
Yeah, like he's trying to well, he's trying to like save he wants to help his friends with the power because he doesn't want to get hurt. Want to get hurt by it. He also has to feel the bad fact that uh that he gets Thanks. Okay. Um, man, this is really hard because a, a lot of the characters were, you know, some of my favorites. But if I had to choose, it would either be a tie between Alpha or Kerberfer. Uh, Alpha, because like you said, Taylor, you know, he started off as the shy, timid guy. And then eventually he grew up and became a lot more confident in season two. And Kerberfer, because, you know, uh, a, a lot of people quoted this and even the show that he's like this little grumpy marshmallow man. And... <laughs> That happens to be a joke if you're a TTA fan. Anyway, uh, that, um, you know, he's, you know, the, the grump who just wants to play the game for fun. And then as time yeah. goes on, you know, he starts, you, you start seeing that he's trying to do everything he can to save his friends, even though that that's not exactly the right thing to do. But, um, but you can kind of see, yeah, exactly. You can kind of see what he's trying to do, even though that that's not exactly something that would be done normally. Anyway, so uh, day two uh, was, who is your favorite Neck King? So, Taylor. I don't really know how to, how to answer that. I really, really like all the Neck Kings. And I mostly see them all as, like, one force. They were just basically the goal of all the players to, like, be able to put on the levels. That's why I sort of like the, the two, two episode arc of the fights and all that. It's basically, like, that was the goal of, of our main characters. They wanted to get to that position so they could, like, fight face alongside, like, the Net Kings and basically get their wish and all that. Okay. It feels, it feels more like they were the actual goal of the whole series rather than actual characters to me, even though they are still great characters. Sure. That's an inter interesting way to look at it. What would you say, Jim? Before his turn at the end, I would have said Ruby rules, but I think I'm going to have to go with Bitch Room just because of how, just because of how entertaining he was in his fight with Kerb, with Kerb before. Yeah, uh, he was really hilarious. Um, I guess if I were to choose who my favorite Neck King is, I would probably have to say either Ruby Rules or Bitram. Ruby Rules because of his introduction being one of the highlights of episode 12. And, you know, of, you know, his eventual turn into what kind of character he became, even though that he was trying to help society, but he was doing it in a, in a you know, kind of like in a corrupted and selfish way. It became very yeah. interesting, you know, uh, his character portrayal. And Bitram, because he was a really hilarious oh. character, especially oh. when you saw him fight with Kerberfer. All right, how about you, Ryan? Who's your favorite Net King? I'd, I'd go with Bitram. Okay. This fight was great. Yeah. Especially I love how Kerberfer was just jumps on him like this. defeats him by jumping up, and that was great. Come on, open the box. <laughs> all right, all right. A lot, of, a lot of love for the mushroom man today. Yes, indeed. All right. Um, day three was. Well, what is your favorite friendship slash relationship? Favorite friendship slash relationship. I would say cover for an alpha. It's very easy to go go for the alpha and flame girl thing because it's so lovely, dovey, and all that. But with Kerb for an alpha, you can tell that they, they are, like, sort of, like, online best friends sort of thing. And you can see their relationship sort of, like, tear apart slowly and slowly as the series goes on. And they start to, like, not really understand each other because Kerber is kind of, like, backing away because he can't really say everything about them. Because, like we said, he's just trying to save everybody, but in a sort of, like, not really good way. So he has to remove himself to be the Zeto. And, and Alpha just doesn't understand him. We finally get like that whole crescendo to their friendship in the fight in the final episode, which to me felt sort of really forced. I, I don't know. There was that that sort of thing like where Alpha finally realized that oh my god, Sido and Kerberfer, they're the same person. Oh, Even what a twist! Exactly the same. I could have found that out like an episode ago, and this whole thing would have worked out so much better. I felt, it just felt at that moment, it just felt too convenient that uh, he finally understood it. Uh, All right. But, but still, it was still a whole best friend thing. It's sort of like the tragedy of it makes you sort of, like, admire it. All right. How about you, Jim? Uh, my favorite friendship would have to be between Whitey and Saturn Diva. Oh, great choice. They don't get a lot of their time, but they play off each other well. You have, you know, Whitey, who's a little more reserved, but she can geek out. And then Saturn Diva, who's a bit more aggressive, a bit more headstrong. I get, 
tomboyish, I wouldn't say is the right term, but uh, they, pl they play off each other well, and when they're working, and when they're with uh, Flame Girl, it just adds a whole new dynamic. Uh, I was going to say Cobra and Alpha, but Jory did that. Um, you can you can discuss you can discuss about it. Go ahead, Ryan. Okay, that's fine. Um, my favorite pairing. Um, I do like Alpha and Kerberfer, but I'm gonna have to say Nylock and Game Crazed. I really like their um, companionship and their ability to work together. Like when you saw in Episode Six and then Episode Eight and Nine with the Gemini tournament. And they just had this really great chemistry together. They were able to, you know, respect each other. They were able to understand one another, even though that, you know, with Nylog having his reserved personality to himself, not wanting to share with everybody, and Game Craze holding the secret that Game Craze is softy. But, yeah, I really like their um, partnership together. Day four, which was, what is your favorite moment in the entire series? So, Taylor? I would say my favorite moment is between Game Grease and Nylock during the moment where Nylock finally shows his real self. That was just sort of the most human moment in, in this whole series. Like where Nylock finally showed like he's just do, doing this for escape. He doesn't want he doesn't want to like be facing all these hackers and all that. He just wants to do it for fun. And that just felt like the most truthful thing to me. Like that would be like how most people would react. Like, we don't want all these, like, end-of-the-world hacker scenarios. I just want to, like, kill goblins and all that. Uh, that's a great uh, answer there, Taylor. Uh, how about you, Jim? Uh, probably for episode four, the entire team taking down uh, Raccoon after he took control of the boss they were fighting. Because he put up a hell of a fight, and they all had to come together and really push themselves to bring him down, and it was just so satisfying. Uh, that's a great choice. Um, Ryan, how about you? Uh, I'm gonna have to go with episode 10, where, uh, like, that whole fight was, with like, uh, Alpha and Seto. Okay. Because it really shows how, how much Kerbifer is, is going, is going to, it's a, oh, sorry, uh, it's, how far Kerbifer is going to go to help Alpha. Um, my favorite moment. Um, I guess my favorite moment, um, uh, that's really tough. I mean, I, I agree with Jim that, you know, one of my favorite moments is when Nylock finally confesses to Game Craze about who he really is. And another favorite moment is the campfire scene in which they all sit together talking about how they wanted to meet in real life and showcasing about how true their friendship was. And it would eventually build up in episode 12 and episode 15. Um, okay, now day five, which was... What was your favorite fight in the series? Taylor. I, I don't know. There's so many good fights in this. Like, that's what, the, what I love most about Tome. Like, Chris was able to, like, animate fight scenes so well, more than any other, like, online series that I've seen so far. Like, it's really sort of, like, disappointing that most, like, the online series that we see is mostly just the, like, the episodic, like, oh, here's a funny joke, and that's it. This had, this had a whole, whole, like, everything to it. It was the whole package. But if I had to, like, boil those up my favorite fight scene, uh... Guess it would have to be Kerberfer versus uh, John Tron. <laughs> I'm just gonna go on and John Tron. Kerberfer and John Tron. <laughs> okay. It is just John Tron. It was the funniest one, and it showcased really the f first fight scene in this movie, the first major one. Second that. Yeah. All right. Um, how about you, Jim? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to agree with Taylor there. Fight between Kerberfer and Sniper Wheel. All right. Uh, what's your favorite fight scene, Ryan? I'm gonna be amazing again. Like episode ten, the and Seto. Okay. Uh, my favorite fight scene. Um, it'll have to be a tie between um, Alpha and Zeto's fight in episode five because that was the first time in which I was really getting myself fully invested into the show. Uh, the fight with Alpha versus Ruby Rules, that big, huge, climactic fight in which you have Ruby Rules transforming into like this gigantic creature when he fuses with the um, the, the, the uh, with the dragon uh, bug virus and uh, the dragon bug antivirus and Alpha being fused with um, the Forbidden Power and you know having this huge fight and then eventually you know you have uh, Ruby Rules trans transforming into Alpha and them fighting together using all of their powers and. It's able not to not only showcasing about the characters, um, you know, fight to wanting to get their t um, goals accomplished, but also it showcases about how much the animation had improved since then. 
All right. Uh, let's see. Day six, which was, uh, what was your favorite episode in the entire series? Like I said, the whole first for se- season was like, I would take that as one whole big episode. And, and well, I said before, the season two felt like more like uneven to me. So I'll just say season one is my favorite episode. <laughs> okay, sure. Why not? How about you, Jim? Um, I think I'm gonna, again, gonna be predictable, just stick with episode four. Sure. Ryan, how about you? What was your favorite episode? Episode 10. Episode 10. Okay. My favorite episode was episode 15 because of everything just coming together, all culminated into one. Everything was able to conclude on such a great note, some of the best... Uh, Some of the best fights, some of the best character portrayal, some of the best acting, some of the best music was all featured in that episode. And if I had to choose like a a typical episode, it'll have to be episode 12. Because of all the great fights that involve with the Net Kings and the dramatic points in which the characters in the Net Kings confront with one another about the Forbidden Power. So yeah. Alright, and episode 7 was just some sort of free-for-all about, you know, anything that they wanted to discuss about, so if you want to discuss about whatever that you want, that's fine, but I guess I can just leave it with one final question about what did you take away from the show? I wanted to do something like Chris does. Like, that's my goal as a video producer, to, like, develop my own sort of animated series online. Like, I would, I could go to, like, some sort of, like, executive to, like, get something on TV, but this is where I really want to, like, make something. Make something that is for like the community online because that's where like the whole like die hard animation is like becoming like a huge thing nowadays. Like you know, like there's like the biggest shows right now, like one that I'm watching right now, it's like One Punch Man. That's a huge thing online. I wanna become something like that that like gets into like the public consciousness and basically everyone becomes like super like enthralled into it i want to create that overarching story those characters that animation that basically just lasts for years to come and especially online because nothing that you place online will ever go away nope yeah you're right mm-hmm. it'll stay in the minds of everybody for a long time that's for sure how about you, Jim? What did you take away from the show? Oh, well, what I took away with it is that, um, you know, I would say it's, uh, the tone in the end, it's much like Adventure Time, Gravity Falls, and Steven Universe, in that, um, you know, a show doesn't need absolute, the show doesn't need, you know, the most stellar animation or the biggest budget teams working behind it or all star voice cast. As long as it's crafted well, as long as there's effort put into it, it tells a good story. It gives you engaging characters. It will be a memorable experience that people are going to want to enjoy and want to help others enjoy. Good answer, Jim. How about you, Ryan? Uh, well, I'm actually going with the Jim side. Or, you know, as long as you have the good characters, the good characters to root for, and the like, compelling like, narrative, like, it, it doesn't really, the animation yeah, yeah, doesn't matter all that much in the end. I remember what you were talking about in Twitter as soon as you were done marathoning the show. Um, what did you say what, what about it? That it was better than Sword Art Online? Yeah. Say that's not that hard to that's not that hard to get up to uh, not that difficult to do be better than Sword Art Online. You know, it's kind of funny because as soon as I was done watching Tom and I was talking about it with my coworkers, they were talking to me. Uh, they were they were like huge anime fans. They were like, "Oh, you should watch Sword Art Online next." And I'm like, um, "You know, I've been hearing a lot of debate about whether that show is good or not." And they're like, "Oh, no, no, no! You should check it out. It's really good. It's like you know these people going into the computer is like this really original concept." about, you know, these people going online and stuff like that. It's like, I take it that you've never seen programs such as Dot Hack or Reboot or Code Lyoko, have you? It's like, what is that? I'm like, oh, God. If I, 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 it's either the point of either that they don't, you know, they're not really that open into watching these other things, or maybe I'm just getting old. I have no idea. But, yeah, um, I have yet to see Sword Art Online. I have no idea if it's good or bad. Maybe I'll have to see it at some point, but from what I've been hearing from you guys, I shouldn't even bother. I've been hearing a lot of things about it, and it doesn't seem like something I would be interested in. As for me... Um, I took a lot away from it. You know, the fact that he that Chris was able to put in this original idea out in the open for everybody to see. And, you know, while there are some things that are not perfect, I mean, what is anyway? 
he was able to take a shot at it. He was able to showcase about, I have this story that I wanted to tell for a long time. I'm going to present it to people, and if they like it, that's great. And if they don't, then that's fine, too. With his risks, it paid off, and um, it was able to you know, become a hit in some way for a lot of people. It resonated with a lot of people, and it's able to inspire people to wanting to do their own things, and I can respect him for that. And as I mentioned before, knowing his work for a long time and seeing him doing this, that's, that's a wonderful accomplishment in my opinion. You always gotta shoot for the moon. Even if you miss, you land among the stars. Yeah, there you go. Alright, well, do you have anything else to say about it right before we go? series, and if you haven't watched it, we, I guess we would all recommend that you should watch it sometime. Yeah, even though, even right? though we did, even though we did spoil a bit, it is still worth watching just to see how it all, how, you know, just to see how everything develops. Yeah, definitely, I agree. All right, well, that is it for this episode, so you guys have anything to uh, plug or self-promote? Okay. For Kantakona Product for Kantakona Productions, I'll go first. Uh, I'll be working on another spotlight for the Peanuts movie, and my other co-producer Nero Angeles just came out with part three of his review on Frozen. You can both check those out on our channel. And if you want, because there's more goofiness on the way, and my another cartoon corner is on the way of one of the most depressingly bad movies I've seen. Oh, that ought to be fun. Look forward to that. All right. How about you, Jim? Um, not. I have no set deadline for it, but I have uh, two reviews I'm gonna try to get up before the end of the month. One on Yoshi's Woolly World, and one on Batman Arkham Knight. So when I get those up, they will be available on Manic Expression, and I will link when they're ready. Okay. Um, as for me, I recently posted up the interview with uh, Will McRobb, the co-creator of Pete and Pete and Kablam. So if you want to go check those out, you can go check it out. And uh, we should be having like a few more episodes of Casual Chats right before the end of the year. So uh, stay, stay, stay tuned for that. All right, and that is it for this episode. So guys, once again, thank you so much for coming on by. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, that should be it for this episode. So we hope to see you around. So take care. Take care. Take care. Back into the waves of ignition To this concert of shit Like the sunrise, the starlight The wash of the night Don't feel so alone You should know that I've got you We can run now So let's make this one Yeah, we can run Follow me as we pick up speed And set these constellations free Do you see the earth itself? Sound beneath our starlight road.